Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm really pleased to have with me here one of um, the, the leads from the Roar team, um, James Faulkner, who's going to give us a, a talk on what Roar is, or Red Hat OpenShift application runtimes, and the practical side of it. And I'm going to let James introduce his topic and take it away. We can have chat in the chat, online chat. I'll try and answer any questions. And we'll have live Q&A at the end. So um, with that, James, please take it away. OK, thanks, okay, Diane. Thanks, Diane. Oh, we're getting, oh, we're some, getting feedback. some feedback. Okay, I'm going to turn off mine. How does that sound? OK, let's try it again. Yep, much better. OK, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Faulkner. I'm a senior technical marketing manager in the Red Hat Middleware Group, focusing on the ROAR project, or ROAR product, the Red Hat OpenShift application runtimes. Um, and I'm, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, using ROAR in the context of transitioning from monolithic application architectures to microservices architectures. Uh, there has been a couple of briefings uh, a couple of weeks ago by some of my colleagues. Uh, John Kling and the product manager for ROAR uh, went through a number of, of uh, introductory pieces on ROAR, what the, uh, the, de the, the development goals were and, and why this pro product came to light. Uh, my, my colleague Thomas Kvarnstrom did a deep dive on Spring Boot within the context of ROAR. And today I'm going to kind of cover ROAR in general, uh, focusing on that, that transition, what to do with existing applications. Um, I have a demo, uh, about a 20 to 30 minute demo. I'm going to demonstrate all of the runtimes that we have within the ROAR product umbrella and show you how you can use them to uh, start that migration process and getting from monolith, monolith to microservices. Uh, so we'll start with the definition. Uh, can basically, the modernization approaches can be split into two. Uh, number one, modernizing existing applications, so reusing as much as possible, sometimes achieving 100% reuse, but also moving them to an environment with, where the app can benefit from more automation and continuous integration and set yourself up for a future modernization effort with microservices. The other uh, bucket is what some organizations do where they make a concerted effort to build net new apps. So not uh, essentially a rewrite from the ground up, uh, employing modern application development frameworks and architectures and developing a process to get those, those apps to production very quickly and with less downtime in case something fails. So we'll start with uh, modernization. So there's three uh, options here. There's rehost, replatform, and refactor. Rehost is simply moving the application as is with very little or no changes to a more modern application platform like JBoss EAP along with OpenShift. Uh, replatforming is similar to rehosting but is a, a slightly more invasive approach where you start taking advantage of some of the platform's features, uh, like in OpenShift, for example, for better performance or scalability um, or better manageability, or adding new business value incrementally in, uh, as, as opposed to the complete rewrite, which is the third option, the refactor option, uh, using, again, modern app dev technologies and methodologies and tools. Uh, determining which ones you do uh, does require some analysis and prioritization based on um, the business benefit that you expect to achieve and the risk of moving that application. So for example, small apps that are essentially frozen and maybe all the developers have left, those are good candidates for a rehost. Uh, whereas apps requiring high scale and for which you'd like to be able to revise very quickly would be something where you're looking at a replatform or, or a refactor, depending on uh, the, the resources and time that you have. The other three are not, not interesting to us. They're essentially do nothing. And uh, as you've seen countless times uh, in the past, that is really not an option for businesses to really innovate in this digital uh, uh, modernization era. So a couple of diagrams that uh, show exactly what I'm talking about here. So rehosting, again, is taking an existing app, say a Java EE application on a legacy platform like WebLogic or WebSphere, and taking it to a modern EE platform like JBoss EAP, and then ultimately onto a container-based uh, orchestration platform like OpenShift, um, where you can provide, again, ex advanced deployment and CI-CD techniques um, and gain the benefits of these things without doing virt virtually no changes to the application itself. The replatform, again, uh, is doing the same thing, but starting to go down that path of replacing functionality of the application using uh, advanced uh, uh, development techniques like microservices to bring additional business value and to bring additional performance benefits and the ability to get bits to production quicker. Um, 
the now we talk a lot about microservices and we'll I'll talk a lot about it more about it today but the reality is it brings more complexity to the application so there's no more single database for example there's no single source of truth a lot more moving parts that need to be integrated so for customers who aren't ready for that uh, the majestic or fast moving monolith might be a good option um, and some actually argue that it's best to always start with a monolith, even for new greenfield applications, because it gives your developers a familiar environment in which to iterate, uh, get the domain uh, boundaries correct, get the domain models correct, without ha having that additional complexity of, of distributed microservices. Key example here, again, is, is uh, KeyBank. You may have heard of this. It's a, an old bank. They've had a number of acquisitions over the years and inherited a lot of applications. Uh, one of their particular applications was a 15-year-old Java EE application uh, deployed on WebSphere, uh, which, as you can imagine, grew into this huge monstrous thing with really big maintenance costs, and, and they could only get it out the door once a quarter. Uh, so as part of their modernization effort, they refactored it to a more modern application, uh, still a monolith, but kind of a separating the, the front end with an Angular JS app and the back end services all being RESTful uh, services to be consumed by the front end. Again, still a monolith, uh, but they were also able to containerize that monolith and move it to OpenShift, wrap it with the deployment pipeline, and uh, uh, instead of 70 steps, manual steps required in the past, they were able to push a button and, and you know, in, in a few minutes get bits to production uh, much quicker and in a more automated fashion. So they moved their production cycle times from that one, once a quarter or three months to one week. Not only did they achieve that one week delivery, they also cut their production failure rates in half, which is super critical. Uh, one of the benefits of a modernization effort is assuming you will fail and you will fail, uh, but having the, the tools and processes underneath to, to recover from that and be able to uh, get, you know, keep the business moving, keep business continuity in the face of those failures with a modern uh, deployment platform like OpenShift. Okay, uh, so the classic example of this incremental replacement that KeyBank was setting themselves up for is called a strangulation, and I'm gonna demo this in a moment. Instead of rewriting the application entirely, small bits are re-implemented using things like microservices. Over time, you can uh, uh, migrate the entire application over from a monolith to a microservices application in small bits, which means less risk, less downtime, and more time to kind of get things right. Uh, it also involves, it can, uh, you can also in introduce new business uh, value to the application because simply rewriting an app brings no additional business value. Uh, but if you are able to add business value, which again, I'll demo in a moment, you can really justify that cost of the overall uh, effort of strangulation. The last one is refactor. This is the complete rewrite. It's generally more expensive, but as it, there's a lot more upfront cost, but can also provide the most benefit. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a number of choices to be made when you, when you go down this path around language and framework and development approach. This is where Roar comes in, uh, but those choices need to, be, need to be made before the first line of code is rewritten. So as you can imagine, each of these comes with a, a number of different trade-offs. Rehosting, again, is generally the cheapest, uh, takes the least amount of time, but also bears the least amount of fruit. It's still the existing application, and all of that application's existing bugs still remain. Replatform is, replatforming is kind of in the middle. It gives you a chance to start down that path out of a complete modernization, but it does come at additional cost of moving the application and uh, introducing new services and, and rewriting incremental parts of the application versus just lifting and shifting and, and not touching it. And then lastly, rewrite is, of course, the most expensive, but when done correctly, has the, the best bang for your buck. Uh, so again, generally deciding which approach you take involves some analysis, some answering of some key questions like what's your big, biggest, what's your overall business objective for app modernization, um, uh, and are you able to measure that business objective so you know if you're going in the right direction. Um, a number of other questions here. Uh, I guess the last one's probably the, the most in interesting, um, considering regulatory requirements that may dictate the types and locations of deployments that you may be required. Like for example, you may not be able to host your customer's data across the ocean in a different country, for example. Um, or if you have regulatory requirements around uh, networking and certain types of traffic cannot pass through certain uh, types of, of deployments or certain nodes, for example, um, those can all be handled, of course, with uh, a modern deployment platform like OpenShift. 
So uh, the, that the we talk a lot about building microservices and, and fast moving monoliths, but the reality is well before you start considering microservices, there's a number of other things that have to occur up front because simply use, writing a microservice application using a 30 year old process that takes a quarter or three months to release software in is not gonna do you much good. So there's a number of things that have to occur up front like Number one, accepting and uh, and and reorganizing to a kind of quote unquote DevOps approach, uh, where you have a you kind of break down that wall of confusion between developers and operators. They start speaking the same language. For example, using uh, Linux containers, um, and they they both agree that they're kind of responsible for their their own um, uh, bits of code. Uh, when they when it goes all the way from the developer's desktop out to production, uh, getting developers efficient at at Pushing bits to production essentially means getting out of their way. So self-service and on-demand infrastructure where developers can order uh, new development environments in minutes instead of weeks is critical to, uh, to meeting those, 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 uh, effort, or, uh, those goals of getting bits to production faster. Once you have developers working quickly, you need a, quickly, a way to automate the build uh, of those applications in a consistent uh, manner using things like Red Hat Ansible or Puppet or Chef or some other uh, automation framework. Um, once you are able to build consistently, you need to de be able to deploy and deliver consistently and continuously. So this is where your de automated delivery pipeline comes into place uh, using CI CD uh, platforms like, like OpenShift and uh, Jenkins and things like that. Um, once you have the builds moving quickly through the through a pipeline, you need to be able to land them in production safely. So autom advanced deployment techniques like blue green and, and canary deployments allow you to minimize the risk of bad code making it to production. It will happen uh, with these advanced deployment techniques. You'll be able to minimize the impact of those changes, possibly prevent them, but more importantly, be able to undo them if they do occur. Once you have all that, then you can start talking about microservices and uh, fast moving monoliths and, and, and modernizing the applications themselves. But again, you still need to consider which languages, frameworks, and APIs you'll need. This is what Aurora is, is bringing us. So today, the new digital architecture is done in the context of all these buzz buzzwords you see here. APIs are front and center. They're super critical for integrating individual small applications together uh, using contracts and, and uh, well-defined APIs and API versioning and things like that. Um, the number of frameworks, languages, and technologies you can use to do this pales in comparison to even like five years ago. So what we've seen in the industry is a move from the traditional sort of monolithic app, Java EE application server that contains both middleware and the operational platform uh, encompassed or enclosed in uh, a handful of industry standard uh, web application servers like uh, JBoss App Server or Oracle WebLogic or IBM WebSphere or even uh, serverless containers like Tomcat to a, uh, a, a, a split, a separation of the operational platform from that middleware tier. So uh, what we've seen is essentially a bifurcation of the functionality previously supplied by the app server uh, now being provided by an operational cloud platform like OpenShift and by a set of middleware services like JBoss middleware, containerized middleware services on OpenShift to, prov to provide the same level of functionality, but in a more efficient and scalable and modular way. Um, so this is where Red Hat OpenShift application runtimes comes in. So that 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 blue tier at the top, the, the runtimes that are supporting those applications um, Red Hat OpenShift application runtimes is a curated collection of those time-tested frameworks and runtimes that are targeting, specifically targeting cloud-native microservice applications. Uh, the product contains a number of frameworks and runtimes that you'll undoubtedly be familiar with. Uh, so we provide two groups of those runtimes. Uh, the supported runtimes are fully supported by Red Hat. We provide lifecycle management uh, and, and, su and support contracts, for example, for JBoss EAP, Wildfly Swarm, Vertex, Eclipse Vertex, and Node.js. Uh, the other groups of frameworks are those that Red Hat tests and verifies to make sure they run smoothly on OpenShift, like Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Netflix, Hystrix, and Ribbon. And as we go forward, more parts of those libraries will, will fall under the supported umbrella and be integrated with Red Hat technologies. Uh, Roar also pro provides Launch. So Launch is a project generator based on a collection of cloud native samples uh, using the supported and, and tested and verified frameworks um, uh, to provide a very efficient and, and 
and uh, robust initial developer experience. And you'll see that in the demo as well. So uh, let's skip over. So here's the, the actual launch itself. And I kind of wanted to just briefly uh, demonstrate it. Um, so launch is a set of, of samples in the cloud that not only provide you project starting points, but actually will deploy it for you onto OpenShift. So it's essentially a wizard-based uh, in, uh, interface that runs on OpenShift itself and deploys to uh, both OpenShift Online as well as to your local uh, OpenShift container platform if you have it, or OpenShift Origin uh, if you're running that as well. Uh, all of the runtimes are supported uh, that we have in Roar, so Spring Boot, Vertex, Wildfly Swarm, and Node.js. So what this looks like essentially is, here's the uh, the website here, so developers.redhat.com slash launch. So you can launch your project, you can select either OpenShift Online or uh, if you want to build and run it locally, you can do that as well. So I'll just choose that option just for uh, for brevity here. So it'll it'll essentially step me through a number of options for the different runtimes. Uh, so if I reload this here, I might have gotten logged out. Yep, it looks like I got logged out. So let me go ahead and log back in. We'll try this one more time here. Okay, so here's my, I've I've selected my uh, my deployment type is build and run locally. So I'll build and run locally. I can select the mission type. So here are the microservice uh, missions you can choose, circuit breaker, externalized configuration, health check, and so forth and so on. I'll go with, say, a circuit breaker, uh, and then I can choose the runtime. So all of the previous lists of types of applications you saw are available for the different runtimes. So we'll go with Vertex, uh, click Next. I can provide the project information, click Next. And in this case, since I'm doing a local install, it will download it. I can click Download. It'll download a zip file. I can then unzip that and, and load that in my IDE and go and take a look at that example code. Again, not something you're going to use in production. This is really an initial developer experience to get you up and running quickly. Uh, it's, it's, it's more than just a project generator. It actually targets specifically microservice applications like health checks and fault tolerance types of features you find in typical microservice applications and then applies those to the individual runtimes within Roar. So that's the starter, uh, and you can quickly get started with that. Uh, for developers who are more interested in uh, advanced developers who, who are going beyond the getting started experience, the way you consume Roar from Red Hat uh, depends on the technology. So three of them are Java-based. So Vertex, Wildfly Swarm, and Spring Boot are all Java-based. And so the typical way you build Java applications is with Maven or Gradle. So the artifacts that you'll that you'll essentially download for the Roar product come from the Maven repositories that Red Hat hosts, uh, in addition to the upstream repositories for those uh, unsupported uh, components of the runtimes that you'll see in a moment. Uh, but we have a maven.repository.redhat.com, which is our official Maven repository. For Node.js, uh, Node.js is not a Java application, obviously. Um, the way you consume that is through the uh, container uh, Linux container image that we have hosted on our Red Hat container catalog, which is at uh, uh, registry.access.redhat.com. So essentially, these are the, the 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 release channels that these bits are going to that you can use in your projects. Quick example, and then we'll get to the demo here. So here's an example using Wildfly Swarm to consume Wildfly Swarm. You simply Using Maven in your palm.xml, you declare the, um, the, the repository from which the bits will come from. Uh, then you declare a dependency on the bomb or bill of materials. This brings in all of the dependency information for Wildfly Swarm within the context of Roar. Then from there, you can then specify the individual components within Wildfly Swarm that you want to use. In this example, we're using a, an, a, 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 a a fraction called monitor. I'll, I'll tell you what fractions are in a moment, uh, but you can bring in the different parts and different functionalities that you need from Wildfly Swarm or from Spring or from Vertex using the same technique. And with Node.js, you'll make a change to your package.json file, which again, you'll see in the demo. Okay, so uh, enough talk. Let's get to the, uh, the, the the meat of this presentation, which is a couple of, uh, actually four or five examples. Um, the code is on GitHub if you want to uh, follow along. Um, there are two branches. There's a, the master branch, which contains the starting point from which I will start. And then if you get stuck or, or need help, you can check out the solution branch, which has the uh, essentially the solution to these different exercises. Okay, so we'll start with Wildfly Swarm. So one slide on what, what Swarm is. So Wildfly Swarm, uh, if you think about it from the developer's perspective, shifting to these microservices comes with a lot of changes. 
like the infrastructure is changing to the cloud, the app architecture is moving to more modular distributed services. So Wildfly Swarm tries to provide a familiar path to microservices for Java EE developers. That's important to remember. It's targeted at Java EE developers who are building Java microservices in order to maximize their production, their productivity, and use their existing Java EE skills for building microservices using a subset of Java EE. One of the complaints with Java EE in the past is that the spec has moved really slow and the, the app servers are really big and bloated. Uh, with Swarm, it's, it's essentially just enough of the app server that you need for your microservices applications. So it's particularly useful if you have an existing application, like say a monolith, and you, you want to move that to a microservices architecture over time. Um, uh, you can combine Java EE and non-Java EE technologies using Swarm to essentially reuse your Java EE knowledge and bring in those microservices functionalities that you need in the application. Swarm is based on a standard uh, that the components, none of the components come from the Java EE world. Um, and you know standards are good, uh, but sometimes they don't move as quickly. So you may have heard of MicroProfile. MicroProfile is a collection of uh, a collection of specifications that are very useful for Java EE microservice developers uh, who are writing microservice applications using Java. A number of of uh, vendors have come along and grouped together to kind of form a microservices set of specifications in addition or alongside of Java EE. So it's not part of Java EE. Uh, these vendors are interested in, a, in, the, in microservices applications and moving the Java technology forward to meet these modern business challenges. So Red Hat, of course, is involved. A number of others that you can see on the slide are involved as well. So it's not just uh, Red Hat. It's, it's definitely a, a community of, of, of uh, not only vendors, but also communities themselves, like the London Java community or the Brazil Java community have come together to kind of set this, uh, this in motion. So there's a, a new release was just announced at Java 1 last week, uh, version 1.2. And then 1.2 contains a number of technologies, which we won't uh, specifically get into today. But just know that the micro, micro profile is a set of specifications and Wildfly Swarm is our implementation. So within the ROAR context, here's the support uh, for Wildfly Swarm. We're targeting, again, microservices. So you'll see a number of, of fractions. Fractions are the components of Wildfly Swarm that, in, that encapsulate certain functionality. So you can have a fraction for health checks or a fraction for uh, topology or a fraction for externalized configuration. And you bring those in using the Maven uh, palm.xml example I showed you earlier. Uh, the supported fractions, the certified fractions, which again are, are kind of tested and verified to work well with Swarm, um, are there as well. And then you can see the upstream uh, uh, components, which are currently unsupported as time goes on and we, we hear back from the community and from our customers. Some of those may drop down into supported status. Okay, so what does this mean for uh, for microser for existing applications? So let me show you, um, actually, let me go back to this, uh, bring up my notes here so I don't miss anything here. Okay, so what we're going to do is use uh, Wildfly Swarm to essentially uh, wrap an existing application. So I, this first demo, I have an existing application. Um, it's called, it's a, it's a monolith. Um, it is a, uh, a, basically a, um, let's see here, Wildfly Swarm. So it's essentially a storefront. Um, and let me just go ahead and run this first so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I can just basically do maven clean package, and this will build my monolith. So this is an existing Java EE monolith. I have a number of services, as you can see in the source code here. I have some stateless EJBs for handling the catalog, the product catalog. I have stateful EJBs for handling the shopping cart, so the individual person's shopping cart. And I just built this application so I can look at it here. Here's my monolith.war. Um, I can take this war file and deploy it to any Java EE application. So this is you know 10 years plus old technology um, to, to deploy this application. What I want to do is wrap it with Swarm. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually look at the palm.xml and let's take a look at the changes needed to start using Swarm. So here's the, the, the Maven uh, project file. Very simple. The only dependency it has is on Java EE 7 at the moment. Um, this brings in, you know, uh, I don't know how many JSRs are in Java EE. There's, you know, on the order of 40 or 50 or maybe more. Um, 
So it, it brings in all that. Um, what I want to do with Swarm is just bring in the parts that I need. And I don't quite know because this application was written a long time ago and we don't quite know what it's using. So Wildfly Swarm has a interesting feature uh, for moving from monoliths to microservices called automatic or auto uh, detection of the of the of the Java appli uh, APIs that you're using, and it will automatically bring in the components of Wildfly Swarm needed to uh, salt, resolve those dependencies without bringing in all of Java EE. So let's let's take a look at what I need to do. So I have a plugin for my IDE. This is available for both Eclipse, uh, JBoss Developer Studio, as well as IntelliJ, as well as NetBeans. Um, the the plugin makes it very simple for me to set up Wildfly Swarm. So I choose that option. I'll just click Finish here. And so what it's actually happened is it's it's added two things to my to my uh, XML file. It's added the plugin itself, the Wildfly Swarm plugin. It's a Maven plugin. It's also added the bill of materials for Wildfly Swarm. That's all I need to do. Um, it, it also adds a version specification, so the version of Wildfly Swarm I'm using, which you can uh, change over time. That's pretty much it. So if I want to go ahead and build and run this, um, I can run Maven uh, Wildfly Swarm Swarm Run. And that's essentially going to build my application using Wildfly Swarm and do that auto detection, looking at the source code and figuring out which components are needed. And you'll see this in the output here. Um, so as it's building, you can see right here, it's detected a number of fractions that I, that I need. I'm using CDI for injecting some resources. I'm using EJBs. I also am using JAXRS to expose the RESTful uh, API out to my um, front end. And so then it basically packages that up into a single runnable or fat jar. Um, you can actually see this if I look, take a look at the fat jar. Uh, let's go look at the fat jar. So here's my, my fat jar right here, monolith-swarm.jar. And if I go back to this other terminal, you can see it's running now. So if I were to actually load this in my browser, let's take a look at here. So I'll just go to localhost 8080. And you can see this is my this is my monolith, my my ten year old application written in Java EE, running using Wildfly Swarm, only using the components I need. So this is a very very quick way for an existing Java EE application to kind of warp into the future uh, using Wildfly Swarm. But let's start stop there. So let me stop this one. And now what we want to do is deploy it to OpenShift, for example, um, because I want to write a Jenkins pipeline to wrap around this this monolith. So that's Absolutely easy as well. So we're using, I have a, another plugin that I've already installed called Fabricate. So this is a, a, an open source project uh, championed by Red Hat, which provides integration for uh, uh, projects. It has a Maven plugin to integrate your projects with, with Kubernetes and OpenShift very easily. So I can do things like Maven. Actually, I've already, I have a local OpenShift running. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new project. So this should be familiar to all of you uh, as an OpenShift uh, uh, fan watching here. So I'll create a new project called uh, Swarm. Okay, so I've got my new project. Now I can simply do Maven Fabric 8 deploy. So that's going to go ahead and deploy this existing Wildfly Swarm application, which is wrapped around my monolith, out to OpenShift. So as that builds, again, the, the same the same thing occurs. It does the auto detection, looks looking for fractions. It found the number of fractions I was using. It brought in a number of other fractions to uh, the transitive dependencies of those um, of those dependencies, and then it starts this build uh, using OpenShift. So while that's building, let's shift over to OpenShift and take a look. So here's my new project here, the Swarm project. So nothing's happening yet. You, there is a build in progress. You can see the build here running. Uh, this is my um, my Fabricate build of my application, ultimately going to be running using the um, uh, Java S2I image that's uh, provided uh, by Red Hat. So once that build completes, looks like it's done, um, it will then deploy that application. You can see the application is being deployed at the moment and looks like it's up now. Um, now, if I click on this, You'll notice I get an error here, um, and you probably can guess what this is as OpenShift experts. It's lack of a health check. So my application has no health checks. So that's kind of one of the first things you're going to want to do when you're moving from monolith to microservices. And I'm going to show you how easy that is to do with Swarm. So if I reload this, eventually it will be available. And here's the application now running. But again, that health check is super important, not just to avoid that error message, but also when you're doing things like rolling up upgrades or trying to do uh, canary deployments and things like that. Uh, OpenShift needs to know when the application is healthy and when it's not. 
So let's go ahead and add a health check to, to Wildfly Store. I'm going to show you how easy this is. Again, we're going to invoke our little plugin, which doesn't do a whole lot. And I'll show you exactly what it does once it does it. But I'm going to add a fraction. So I'll click Add Fraction. I get a list of fractions. There's a number of fractions in here. Uh, some of them supported, some of them are uh, are, are unsupported upstream uh, fractions from the community. Uh, but the one I want is supported. It's called Monitor. So I'm going to click Monitor and click Finish. So what this basically did, the only thing that it did to my palm.xml was bring in this dependency, this, this org.wildfly.swarm uh, monitor dependency. What that does is then it gives me the ability to define health checks. So let me go ahead and define a, a, a health check. Uh, real quick in this application. So I'll create a new Java class. We'll call it infra endpoint. It's my infrastructure endpoint. Um, now it's a it's a restful endpoint, so I need to give it a path. A, a, we'll give it a path of infra. And then in my endpoint, I want a health check endpoint. So I'm going to create a get respect or get uh, Jax RS um, endpoint, uh, endpoint. So that path is going to be health. It doesn't matter what I call these. Um, I can call them whatever I want. Uh, you'll see in a moment how uh, Swarm detects this. The way that it detects it is with a health annotation on the class. So public health status, it returns this uh, custom uh, health status object. Uh, you can just return strings if you want, but I'm going to return health status because you may want to do uh, something more fancy than just simply saying, hello, I'm alive. So I'll just call it health. And in this case, I'm just going to return health status dot named, I'll call it uh, foo dot up. So what you can do is actually create multiple health checks. Um, obviously, health checks, you shouldn't be too invasive. You don't want to actually change the state of the application, but you may want to check one or more things in different modular uh, methods, for example, and then you can aggregate them using a single health endpoint that looks at all of them. And if one of them is down, then um, then, uh, then the, the application will be considered to be not healthy. But in this case, I'm just gonna do something very simple here. Uh, one of the last thing I need to do, uh, back on my uh, um, palm.xml, when I start declaring swarm fractions, specifically uh, declaring them, the auto detection is, is by default turned off because it assumes that you know what you're doing and you, you, d you no longer need auto detection because you're telling Swarm exactly which fractions to bring in, which is a good way to minimize. For some fractions, they might not have the most robust auto detection code. But in this case, I, I want that auto detection to continue. So I'm simply going to um, reconfigure uh, the plugin to tell it to continue to do that auto detection, uh, auto detection by setting it to force. Okay, so I'll, I'll save that and I'll go ahead and deploy it again. So instead of using the the, um, the command line, I'm simply going to use my Maven integration in my IDE and just do a fabricate deploy again. So this does essentially a Maven fabricate colon deploy, but uh, it's, I can simply double click it instead of actually typing it because I'm sure you're sick and tired of seeing me type. So it's going to rebuild the application again. It's still going to do that um, auto detection. You can notice it 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 uh, it uh, picked up my con configuration of force. Still does the auto detection. Also brings in the uh, the the detections that um, uh, that are needed as a as the transitive dependencies, and then rebuild the application and redeploy it out to OpenShift. So I shift back over to OpenShift. I can see the application will. Uh, once this build number two completes here, the application will then uh, be uh, redeployed. Uh, one interesting thing to note is during the uh, the build, if I go back to the build here, you can see the um, the health check was automatically added here because I was using that uh, uh, monitor fraction and the associated developer annotations for Wildfly Swarm. It automatically knows how to add Kubernetes uh, OpenShift endpoints for health checking, and then it can it will use that in the application itself. So as the application, the new version of the application comes up, uh, we can take a look at the log file and we'll see. Hopefully, the um, health check will uh, will be um, automatically wired up correctly for us. I search for health. I can see it's still in the process of coming up, and there's my um, health endpoint that was added, uh, services in for health. Oops, lost that one. Um, so it basically took this this health check that I declared an with an annotation and added a, an automatic endpoint uh, to the application, as well as def declared and defined the health check for, my, for, uh, for OpenShift. So if I go back to the overview screen, I can see my application is up now. Um, and when I hit it, it actually is up. Uh, the health check is defined in the deployment config, which you can see here. 
um, automatically defined for me. So very simple way for a monolithic application to start down that path of microservices using Wildfly Swarm. Okay, so let's shift back and, and go on to the next, uh, uh, next runtime here. So we'll go back to our slides if I can find them. Um, let's see if I can find them here. I think it's on this screen here. Nope. The screen, nope. Okay, here we go. So let's move on. So that's Wildfly Swarm. Uh, what we're going to do next is talk about Spring. So uh, Spring and Spring Boot um, is an opinionated framework for building microservices using the Spring framework and with Java EE technologies like JAXRS, JPA, and a few other Spring choices or Spring projects. Um, we've Red Hat's already certified uh, Spring Boot apps on OpenShift using OpenJDK, as well as uh, JBoss Web Server includes support for it. So going forward, we're going to continue to certify more and more Red Hat technologies to be used with Spring Boot, like Hibernate or InfiniSpan or, uh, or more. What Spring is in Roar, it's basically the same Spring that you know and love, but tested and verified by Red Hat's QE department. So that includes Spring Boot, Spring Cloud Kubernetes, uh, Ribbon, uh, Hystrix, uh, the Red Hat components that are part of the Spring ecosystem are fully supported, like Embedded Tomcat or Hibernate or Apache CXF. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, single sign-on technology with Keycloak and Red Hat SSO. We have messaging capabilities with, with AMQ. Um, but more importantly, we have native Kubernetes and OpenShift integration. Much like you saw with Wildfly Swarm, we have a similar uh, set of features for Spring and Spring Boot. We also, again, support the uh, Spring Boot uh, runtime using uh, the launch, the, uh, the, the developer experience uh, website that you saw a moment ago. We also have a number of starters that we've contributed to the Spring ecosystem. Starters are basically a simplified way of bringing in dependencies from the Spring ecosystem into your project using things like POM XML entries and things like that. And then again, as I mentioned, as we move forward, additional functionality like support for transactions or JBoss AMQ uh, will be integrated into Roar as well. So let's take a look at what that's going to look like uh, in reality. So the next demo is a Spring and Spring Boot demo. So what we're going to do is take a piece of our monolith that you saw a moment ago. So let me go back to the monolith and show you what we're going to do here. Um, so this is the monolith again. These components are all part of the monolith, but we want to start splitting them out and, uh, and making them into individual microservices. So for example, the catalog microservice, the, the, the thing that, that gives us the name of the products, the image, and the description, uh, like for example, this one over here. We want to turn that into a microservice and, and in addition, add some additional business value along the way. And we're going to do that with Spring and Spring Boot. So um, I've taken the catalog functionality from my microservice and split it into a Spring Boot application. You can see the application here. Let me close these other ones so they get out of the way here. Um, and this is my, uh, my Spring application here. So you can see I have my Spring Boot application declared here. It's very simple, uh, simple main file. I have one controller. This is providing the list of products. It's essentially going out to its own database and getting a collection of product descriptions and feeding that back as part of this RESTful interface. Um, and that's basically it. So let me go ahead and deploy this and let's see what happens here. So let me go back to my, uh, my integration with Maven here. Spring Boot, uh, plugins, let me create a new project first. Uh, OC new project Spring. And I'm gonna go ahead and deploy this, this uh, microservice out to uh, OpenShift. So I'll just do Fabricate Deploy. Again, Fabricate is an upstream open source project which knows about OpenShift and Kubernetes and is able to take Java applications, package them up, and build them using S2I, and then deploy them out to OpenShift and provide additional functionality like creating config maps and uh, service accounts and secrets and things like that. Uh, so this, this build shot should not take too long. Um, I've also created a very simple UI on top of this microservices just for demo purposes. Okay, so it looks like my build is complete. So let's go ahead and go back to uh, OpenShift and see what, what we got here. So if I go back to my uh, overview here, and I got a new project called Spring. So here's my catalog. It's spinning up. Looks like it just completed. Um, and if I hit the, the external route for that particular application, here's the, my simple user interface for my catalog. Um, it just basically is a, a grid of the different uh, pieces of information in the catalog database. So I can click this fetch button to refetch um, 
the catalog as needed. So the scenario here and what we want to do is not only split out the, the catalog, but also add a new business value. The scenario is that we our supplier chain is pretty weak. And the products that we're getting, like the Red Hat Fedora or the JBoss Forge Community Project Sticker, they ha oftentimes have a lot of quality problems uh, from the manufacturer who are, are creating these um, these these kind of tchotchkes that you can give out at a, at a trade show. So we're constantly getting product recall notices. We need to be able to quickly remove products from our catalog. The problem is that our 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 catalog backend is you know 30 year old technology um, that is takes weeks to get changes into. So what we want to do is, is provide a new interface. And we're going to do that with Spring, Spring Boot and OpenShift uh, through uh, a config map. So that's kind of the, the typical way you do externalized configuration in OpenShift. So I'm going to show you how easy that is to do uh, in the code itself. So what we're going to do is we have this. This is the code that actually returns the list of, of uh, products. And we want to be able to filter that in our microservice because this is a simple uh, call back to a simplified database. but Imagine if it was, you know, again, a, 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 a super old, um, um, uh, very large uh, system that, that takes weeks and months to get changes into. So we want to do it here. So in order to do that here, we need to provide an interface. So we're going to create a new Java class. We'll call it store config. And in order for this to participate in the Spring ecosystem, I'm going to declare it to be a component not only a component, but a set of configuration properties with a prefix of store. And you'll see what this is used in a moment. It's basically anything in the config file that starts with store will be considered to be part of this uh, configuration class. So my store config is going to contain one thing. It's a list of recalled products. And it's let me generate uh, some getters and setters for it. So I'll go ahead and do generate getter and setter. OK, so here's my essentially a bean, um, a spring bean, which encapsulates my externalized configuration. Um, now, once I, now that I have that, I can now inject it into my controller uh, using Spring's auto-wired uh, capability. So private store config, config. And now that I have my configuration, I can now filter my list. So dot filter, um, and I'll filter the list of products returned to only those that the config get recall products does not contain um, the product in questions ID, get item ID. So this is essentially a, a um, Lambda expression that will, for any product that does appear in this list of, of uh, called products, will be filtered from this list. Um, so I think that's in place. So the only last thing I need to do is bring in the, the components of the Spring ecosystem that support this, so Spring Cloud Kubernetes in particular. So in my uh, pom.xml, I've already typed it in here for demo purposes. I'll just uncomment that out, save that, and now I should be able to redeploy this out to uh, to OpenShift. So I'll double click the deploy button here again, run this, and what will happen is it will deploy it to OpenShift, create the config map, which will contain the list of recalled products, and uh, implement the uh, the filter that I just implemented to filter the list of products uh, when I want to remove something from the catalog. So that, that looks like it's in progress. So while that's going, let's switch back to OpenShift and I'll show you the config map here. So the config map is created. Uh, here's my list of recalled products that's completely empty at the moment, uh, but my application looks like it's in the process of, uh, of being redeployed here. It should come up momentarily. Uh, take a look at the log files to make sure nothing crazy happens here. You see the uh, the spring uh, tag here. Uh, looks like everything's working. So let's go ahead and hit this uh, endpoint again. So here's my application. All of my products are there. So let's go ahead and remove this first item. So 329299. So we go over here and edit our config map, which now gives us a, an externalized configuration and the ability to remove uh, products. I can, if I edit this config map and add that number, Hit save, it automatically is reloaded. And if I go back to my uh, my new application here and I say fetch catalog, you can see the Red Hat Fedora has now disappeared from the um, from the list of products. So I can edit that, I can add and remove products. This provides a huge business value because it saves the business's reputation of uh, by not distributing junk uh, quality uh, materials um, and my business is happy. So if I, now, now let's think back to the monolith. So the monolith is here. This is my monolithic application, which is my real business critical application, not the uh, toy application I just created, but it has the same interface. 
So, but the 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 Red Hat Fedora in this case is still in the product catalog, and this is because obviously the monolith has no idea that I just created this microservice. So let's tie them together and start that strangula strangulation of my monolith into a microservices architecture. So we'll keep our existing code as is. We're not going to change our monolith at all. We're not going to change our new microservice. We're simply going to tie them together using OpenShift and its ability to do uh, clever software-defined networking. So what I'm going to do is in the in the uh, list of routes that I have for my for this application. So again, remember I have the catalog and I have the um, the uh, where is the swarm application here? My 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 my, my uh, sorry, my monolith. Actually, I need to deploy this to the same uh, project. So let me go ahead and switch to my project and redeploy this um, the uh, the uh, catalog because I want them to be in the same project because they're going to be talking to one another and I haven't set up the ability to talk between different projects. So I'll just redeploy this exact same uh, microservice to my um, to my swarm project, to my monolithic project. So that'll come up. Um, and once that comes up, I'll be able to then do that, uh, that clever routing I was talking about, which will essentially strangle my monolith and remove the, cake, the catalog functionality from the monolith and replace it with my microservice using Spring Boot from Roar. So once this, uh, once, once this new application comes up, I should be able to uh, create that. So let's go ahead and make sure the build is still in progress. Looks like it just completed. So it's now being deployed here. So here's my catalog in the same project as my, my monolith. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a essentially a redirection route. So uh, you're all familiar with routes from the, uh, from the OpenShift world. I'm going to take any application, any request that comes into my monolith, I want to now redirect that to my new uh, piece of functionality written as a microservice. So I'll create a new route. I'll call it redirect. Uh, the host name I'm going to use is the monolith host name. Um, the path is this, the path that the monolith is expecting to get its list of products from. So anytime this path is hit, I'm going to redirect that to the catalog service on the same ports and same um, um, RESTful um, uh, addresses and just hit create. Now I have this redirection in place. Now if I, if I then hit my monolith, I can see that uh, once my application comes, oh, I need to uh, edit the uh, config map again obviously to remove that, uh, the same project because I've redeployed it. So let me go ahead and edit that, add uh, my, my Red Hat Fedora product ID to my list of recalled products. If I go back to my monolithic application here, you can see as I reloaded it, the, the Fedora is now gone. So I've essentially um, strangled my monolith. I've started the strangulation process. And you can do that with a number of the other components here, like the pricing and the inventory service and the ratings and reviews, if you had those. Um, and then ultimately, you'll get to a point where you've completely gone from monolith to microservices using um, using uh, Roar. So we've got, um, I guess, about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, I have, I have actually two more demos. I think I'll just do one. Um, I'm going to focus on Vertex because that's kind of the, the interesting um, runtime here. And we'll quickly go through this, um, see if I can, I can do this uh, rather quickly. So Vertex is the third uh, runtime within Roar. Um, it's really great for high performance, low latency, high uh, uh, concurrency applications, web applications in particular. The reason why it's good for that is because of the nature of reactive, reactive programming and event-driven asynchronous execution models. So to, to briefly illustrate that, take a look at the execution model of a single threaded synchronous application. This application has three uh, tasks to perform, blue, green, and red. So in a single threaded synchronous model, blue runs until it's completely done and exits, then green runs, then red runs. Not too much to say here, except that it's going to be really, really slow, um, especially for high IO applications that are waiting a lot on disk or network or some other resource. Uh, the second model is a threaded model. This is a traditional model that you're probably familiar with if you're a Java, uh, Java EE or Java developer. This is where the tasks run in parallel on different cores or different threads of a computing system. The CPU is able to switch between them freely at any time. So that means you're, as a developer, if you're writing code in these, they have to be thread safe. You have to deal with 
uh, synchronization locks and mutexes. Um, and you have to coordinate between these threads so that the state is what you expect and you don't corrupt the state or get things like race conditions or deadlocks. This is also called preemptive multitasking. Uh, the third one is the asynchronous model. This is one we'll concentrate on. This is where the developer controls that interleaving. It's also called cooperative multitasking. Gets rid of those really nasty things like race conditions and deadlocks and blocks of synchronized code. It does this uh, through uh, a mechanism you'll see in a moment. But uh, important to know that it's been around for a long time. It's not like Vertex or Node.js invented this stuff. It was used on the space shuttle, you know, 30 years ago, um, where when you push the button to fire the um, the thruster, it better fire the moment you push the button and not a few seconds later. Um, it's also been used in in uh, Windows and uh, Windows 3.x in particular. Um, Essentially what it is, is the bits of code from blue, green, and red in my example, they run until they're, until, until it's, it's, uh, until it's done, until it reaches a good stopping point. For example, when you go out to a disk or a database, once that occurs and you're waiting on a callback, other code can run like red code or blue code in this example. Um, so it's important to note that your code runs un uninterrupted until you sell it to stop. So if you write user interface code and you block, you get things like this, right? You can paint the screen with a dialog box, right? This is a terrible bug, but I'm sure you've all seen it in the past. This is because the thread blocked uh, when it shouldn't have in the UI and um, it, it produces artifacts like that. Um, so that's to be avoided, but consider what it buys you. Um, essentially it buys you nothing. If blue, green, and red were completely CPU bound, it would buy you absolutely nothing because uh, they would just run until they're done and there's no waiting for anything. Um, but it does buy you things when there are wait times, like for example, web servers that are waiting on databases or user in input or some other thing that takes a non-trivial amount of time. It also is a big benefit when you have a large number of these things, um, because then the interleave can, can happen in such a way that um, you can save a lot of time. If you need to run blue, green, and red, and the task takes you know, a certain amount of time for threaded, if you do asynchronous, you can save a lot of time by essentially interleaving bits of code that are waiting for callbacks um, so that when blue stops and it's waiting for a callback from a database call, then green can run. And then blue can run some more when it gets that callback. And then green can run some more when blue stops again. And you get the idea. You can interleave all of this ultimately at the end on the right side of the screen, saving that amount of time uh, for running all of blue, green, and red. And this is what Vertex does. This is what the, the basis of reactive systems and asynchronous event-driven programming are. Vertex is a, is a reactive toolkit for the JVM uh, and has a number of, of supported languages um, within that, within the JVM. So like Java and JavaScript and Ruby, uh, Ceylon, Scala, Kotlin, and a number of others. Um, it's again, ideal for that high concurrency and low latency services where you have a lot of people hitting a website or a lot of message or machines talking to one another. Uh, it does this through event-driven non-blocking I.O. libraries throughout the entire set of, of libraries and, and components within Vertex. So there's no blocking, there's no waiting. I mean, there is waiting, obviously, but there's no blocking. There's you know things like um, uh, promises and futures and callbacks and things like that to, uh, to really make this application much more flexible and resilient to failure and much more performant. So within Roar, here's the list of uh, supported components within uh, within Vertex. Um, you can see, again, we target the microservice developers. So externalized configuration, circuit breaker, health check, service discovery, uh, and a number of other components within the Vertex ecosystem that are targeting specifically for microservices and reactive microservices. So for example, if you're familiar with Rx Java or you use Rx Java, uh, there's a set of reactive extensions that are in tech preview, but uh, on the road to being supported. Um, or if you're using reactive streams, if you're integrating with uh, AMQ, uh, we support both the AMQP protocol as well as MQTT uh, for cluster management. We're supporting InfiniSpan, obviously. That's a, an open source project championed by Red Hat um, and, and exposed in uh, JBoss DataGrid. Um, and then, of course, the Vertex core itself, which not only consists of the, um, the core web interfaces, but also a shared event uh, event bus, so you can do distributed messaging across different vertex um, in instances across your your cluster. Okay, so uh, so the current release of Vertex is 3.4.2, and that is what is currently included and supported within Roar. To use them, very similar to Swarm, you simply uh, declare some pom.xml entries. We also have boosters, as you saw, which I demonstrated, uh, which which demonstrate a number of microservice concepts within the, the realm of Vertex and reactive programming and reactive systems. 
Um, and the examples that uh, one of the examples I showed you is ex uh, uh, available along with a number of other examples at the uh, the website here listed at the bottom. Okay, so let's do the the last one, the last demo that we have time for here. I also have a Node.js demo, but uh, that one's relatively simple, um, and uh, you can check that out uh, after viewing this one. So, last thing we're going to do is is uh, is Vertex. So let me go ahead and create a new project to hold my um, Vertex example. So create a new project. So what I have is again very similar to the Spring Boot example. I have a catalog, the same product catalog that is implemented not with uh, with Spring Boot but with Vertex. This is going to use an external database. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, is deploy that database uh, very briefly here. So OC project, make sure we're on the right project. OC process. It's a it's it's in a um, a template here. So I'll just create it. And while I'm doing that. Well, that's being created, so it'll deploy MongoDB as the database. So uh, the, the structure of a Vertex project is, is very different than your, your typical um, Spring or Java EE project. Um, the core kind of component within Vertex is called a vertical, which is um, contains basically um, your, your business logic. You can split it up into a number of different verticals, uh, but effectively um, you are writing code in a vertical, much like you would in a Spring Boot component, for example. So here's my simple vertical. Um, this vertical is a web vertical, exposes a, a set of, of RESTful APIs. So I can say slash get slash products, and it will give me that, that list of um, of products from the catalog. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a circuit breaker using the supported version of uh, Vertex circuit breaker within Roar. So to add that circuit breaker, the first thing we're gonna do is declare it in our pom.xml. So let me just go and find a good spot here to declare this. So I'll just put it here. Um, we'll call it dependency uh, vertex dash circuit breaker. So very simple, right? Just like all of the other dependencies, I have a new dependency called circuit breaker. Once I have that, now I can uncomment the code that I've already written here. So I can bring in a circuit breaker object here, and that's that will be uh, uh, configured here. Let me import that properly. And then here's my circuit breaker object itself. And there are a number of, of um, configuration options for a circuit breaker, like how many times will it fail before it opens the circuit. If you don't know a circuit breaker, it basically protects calls to an, some other service. If that call fails a number of times, it will do what's known as opening the circuit and falling back to some other strategy to get the same amount of data. This pre prevents uh, uh, subsystems and microservices from being overloaded by too many requests. If it gets overloaded, the circuit is opened and it gives the, the service a chance to recover through things like OpenShift uh, scaling and 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 pod, you know, d d detecting that a pod is unhealthy and killing it and, and replacing it with a new pod. So that's what a circuit breaker does. Ultimately, it then comes back once the uh, once the service uh, is is ready to go it's here. So I have my circuit breaker object. Here's the API call that I want to protect. So what I want to do is protect the API call that makes the call to its database. So this is reactive code already. This is calling to our database. Uh, what we want to do is, let me get rid of some of the screen here. So we're just basically going to wrap this with a circuit breaker and show you what the what the um, what the effect is. So instead of making that call to get products and waiting for a response through my callback, I'm going to call circuit breaker dot execute with fallback. So uh, it, let me fill out the code here, um, and then I'll explain exactly what's going on here. Okay, so. This is the call to my circuit breaker to protect the call to the database. It, you give it some code to call. You give it some code to call when the original call fails, which is called the fallback. And then you give it some code to deal with the results of either the fallback or the original version of the code if it succeeded. So we essentially just need to fill these three things in. So let me get rid of, and I'll just keep this here. Okay, so let's fill in the code to call the, the, um, the, the database. So we're gonna take the existing code and just copy and paste that. Here, actually, let me leave that here. I'll just paste it in here. So here's my existing call, right? I don't care if it succeeded or failed. So I'm gonna remove the, um, the error checking code here. I only care, I, I don't care about anything. In fact, if it fails, I want it to fail properly and, and go to my fallback. So I'm just gonna remove the code that deals with error checking, also remove the code that deals with uh, responding back to the client, because I only want to do uh, return this, this value from this call. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna complete the, uh, the future. So response dot, where is it? Uh, it is in event 
object.complete. And I'm going to complete it with uh, the list of objects, the list of, of products from my um, from my database. So that list is incorporated, is, is encapsulated in this JSON object. So I'm just going to complete it with that. OK, so that's the code to my existing code to make the call and return the value by completing the, uh, the future. There's a lot of reactive concepts I'm glossing over here. Uh, we don't have time to kind of do a complete uh, thing, but this is essentially a callback. I call this get products, and then when that returns, when that's ready to return, this code is actually completed. If that if that code fails, then I want to return something else. So this is my uh, my fallback. So in this case, I want to return something else, and we're just going to hard code it here. So we're going to return a new JSON array which contains um, a single product. And just for demo purposes, we'll call it, uh, let's see, fallback products, fallback description, and I give it a, a an item ID of call it one. And then the last is the price. So we'll just give it a one million. Now in reality, your fallback is gonna do something a little more um, interesting than this. It's not gonna return something hard coded in most cases. It's going to, um, to do something like check a cache or go to an alternate service or something like that. But in our case, for demo posters, we're just going to return uh, this um, this method, or sorry, this, this hard-coded value. So there's my return for my fallback. And then lastly, the code to actually deal with call, uh, sending it back to the client is the same code from down here. So we'll just copy and paste that code in here. Um, instead of this object, we're going to call the um, event.get, or sorry, Event.result.encode prettily. So there's the code. Let me delete the old code. Here's my new um, circuit breaker enabled uh, responsive code using Vertex in Roar. A lot of this can be simplified. You'll notice my IDE is telling me that I can replace these with simplified expressions. So I'll go ahead and do that. Um, a couple of others in here. I think that's it for now. Um, okay, so it looks like my, I'm good here. Now I've, I've essentially wrapped my call to my database with a circuit breaker configured in the code that you saw earlier. Uh, so let's go ahead and try this out. So let me go ahead and deploy this out to, uh, to OpenShift again. I'm going to use the, uh, the same integration I have with my IDE here for Vertex plugins. Go to Fabricate, uh, make sure I'm on the right project. Project Vertex, and I'll go ahead and deploy this to my to my uh, my new project I created. So what should happen is when I hit this slash products API, it should uh, wrap the call to the database with a circuit breaker. So you can imagine what this demo is going to be. I'm going to run it. It should look fine. I'm going to kill the database, and then we'll see hopefully the the uh, the fallback be employed here. Again, the fallback in my example is going to be a very simple hard-coded um, list of products, this fallback product here. Um, but in, in a real-world application, you would do something a little fancier. OK, so it looks like that's been deployed. So let's go back to OpenShift um, and go to my new project here, my Vertex project down here. And it looks like my, my database is up here, my new uh, catalog uh, microservice is up here. So let's go ahead and hit that. So here's my, uh, my catalog. I can click, again, the fetch catalog. I can get a list of products, the same exact set of products that I had before. Now let's kill the database and, 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 uh, and witness what happens and how that fallback uh, actually happens. So I will go ahead and take my database down by scaling it to zero pods. So if I go back to my, uh, my microservice here, or sorry, my, uh, my I click fetch catalog. You can see it took a couple seconds, and then the fallback is, was employed uh, to, to return this fallback product. Again, you would do something fancier in a real-world application. Um, let me bring the database back up. And then after the timeout, the configured timeout of, I think it's five seconds in the, um, in the circuit breaker, as well as the health checks that need to pass in OpenShift, once this application comes back up and, and all of those timeouts expire, the and I hit the, the I hit the service again, it will retry that call to the database. That time it should should succeed because the circuit is is closed again and the application goes about its its normal business. Uh, so it looks like the application the, the database is still coming up. So if I if I um, hit this uh, endpoint, it should still fail. If I hit fetch catalog. Looks like it's still failing. So once this new uh, service, once the database comes back up, looks like it's it's back up now. So if I shift back here, ultimately once that timeout again, there's a there's a number of timeouts that are in play here to give that service a chance to uh, to come back to life. So it'll it, it could take up to you know 20 or 30 seconds for this um, for this catalog to come back. So we'll just keep hitting it here, and hopefully it'll eventually come back unless I have a 
problem in my code, which is not unlikely. Um, so it looks like the, the database came back, the circuit was closed uh, using the Vertex circuit breaker, and my business is back up and running um, using uh, Vertex. So that's it for the uh, demos. I had, a, again, I had a Node.js demo, uh, which we don't have time for today, uh, but um, you can check that out um, it, on the, uh, the, the code um, uh, pointer I gave earlier here, github.com slash James Faulkner slash roar dash examples. Okay, so last slide here, summary. Um, so it's, essentially what we've done is I've showed you how you can take monolithic applications and move them to microservices applications, either in a big bang approach using roar or incrementally and preserving the value that you've already invested in your existing applications. So there's multiple technical solutions for this modernization, depending on not only how much time and resources you have, but also regulation and the amount of risk that you want to take. Not everyone moves at the same speed. So Roar and Red Hat in particular are designed to support you, whether you're doing traditional Java EE with stateful workloads or modern cloud native workloads. Uh, so with Red Hat and Roar, you can we provide that trusted solution for both your today's exi existing business critical apps as well as a supported path to the modern application architectures with microservices and the popular frameworks that we uh, that we talked about today. So I think I'm done, uh, Diane. I know I went over time. Um, I appreciate okay. it, and um, I'll not hand it back to you. Um, the only question that anyone had, and uh, you just roared to use a bad phrase, um, through through those demos. And I am so impressed because they were all live and they're all going and nothing crashed. I was like, totally <laughs> was a, yeah. I was just waiting for something, but no, it kept going and kept going. It was like the Energizer Bunny on top of OpenShift. So wonderful. Um, if you could go back one slide so that sure. um, the one question was about where these the files were. So you had a slide there um, somewhere that had the, the directory where your slides all were hiding. So if we oh. end, uh, not, the, um, not your slides, but the, um, the GitHub repo with the examples. Yes, this one here. Yes, end on that. That would be the great spot because everybody was asking where all this code was um, so that they could go play with it themselves. And um, you've done a, a great job on this, so thank you. And I'm totally psyched. I learned a ton of stuff and I love the metaphor of the strangulation. Um, <laughs> I hadn't heard that one before and so I'm so gonna use that again. That was great, uh, a great way to strangle those monoliths. And yeah, It's a bit one. morbid, but uh, it, it aligns nicely with the Unix philosophy of, of killing processes and zombie processes and yep. things like it's, that. It's the perfect ha Halloween um, session. So thank you very much. Well, I'm definitely gonna have you back on um, to do some more because uh, you, you just rocked it today. So thank you very much. And um, I think there's one other thing in the chat, but I'm betting, yeah, fantastic pre presentation. Really, really well done. So thanks. I'm going to end the recording and...